to many amateurs in Senate today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Making me feel quite at home here. Hey, have a seat, everybody. Great to be here at Manningham Christian Centre. Centre. <laughs> With Pastor Matt, or is it Pastor Matthew? Matthew. Matt. Yeah, my son's called Matt. I never call him Matthew, just call him Matt. And Anna? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's great to be here. And um, wasn't the worship great this morning? Awesome worship team. Really good. Having a senior pastor who's also a drummer. <laughs> How good is that? Um, look, I really probably don't know any of you here and you don't know me. Uh, and so um, let me just tell you that, um, yeah, I'm Mike Smith. I have got a wife, Julie. I have got four children. I have got four grandchildren. And there are two more coming in the next month. Haha, <laughs> can't wait. How amazing. Um, I've been... Um, I'm not a senior pastor at the moment, but I've been a um, I've been a pastor for 33 years. Yeah. 33 years, <laughs> yeah, it's a long time. Um, six years. I I spent the first six years of my um, uh, pastoring working for Pastor Brian Houston at um, what was then Hills Christian Life Centre at Hillsong. And yes, we did have a home fellowship group out in the Hills area, which was the first. So um, that was that was pretty full on. So six years there. And then 27 years um, pastoring in Dingley at a church called Destiny Church, which is now called Echo Church. Um, and two years ago, I handed the church over to my um, son-in-law, Justin Box, and my daughter, Lee Box, and the two of them are now doing a great job pastoring, uh, because I have, uh, two years ago, I set up a ministry called Every Believer Can Ministries, because my heart is the fact that every single believer in Christ can be an effective witness. I believe every single believer, no exceptions, all of us can be a witness for Christ. And so um, that was what I did two years ago. And so I must say I'm very excited to be here this morning. I, I genuinely am. Um, I'm just really praying that God is going to cause me to be helpful here. But I'm excited to be here. Um, in fact, yesterday, I, just as I was making a cup of coffee, which I love, um, I just said, Lord, just Manningham Christian Centre, you know, um, a word. And instantly, um, I just felt the Lord say to me, They've planted a lot of seed. I just felt that immediately came to me. They've planted, they've planted seed. And I, uh, just a word for you guys and, and especially for, uh, for Matt and Anna. Um, you've, you've planted seed and I just encourage you, without me having to explain that away, read the, par the parable of the seed in the ground. Because I, I sense you've planted seed and things have come to try to cause that seed not to grow. But I believe that as you read that parable again, those parables, God will speak to you great words of encouragement from that. The seed is in the ground. And um, I find that exciting. I, I also sense, just by even being here this morning, listening to you singing and being part of church, that um, you really do have a vision to see people come to Christ, which I think is very, very exciting. And um, as I said, my feeling is that when every believer recognizes that um, they can be effective witness for Christ, we're going to see an unstoppable church. We're, we're, we are going to see the church that Matthew talks about in Matthew chapter 16, 18, message version. The mes in, in, in the message version, I will put together my church, a church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. And so I just speak that over this church, a church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will keep it out. And the seed is going to grow. Praise God. It's all good. So um, my goal this morning is to talk about this type of thing because this is what I now do. I come to churches and I talk about witnessing and I know you've had a, quite a, a bit of injection um, in, in this area and I, and I say praise God, it's, it is massive seed. So um, this morning my message is going to be titled Life's Ultimate Journey. Life's Ultimate Journey and the text that I'm going to be looking at is... One of my very favourite scriptures, 
one of my two favourite scriptures of all time. Sorry, we're laughing because it's the start of a new series called The Ancient Gods. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suspect it could well be in keeping. Yeah. But mine will be a certain aspect of it. But <laughs> John chapter 10 and verse 10, one of my favourite scriptures of all time. John chapter 10, verse 10, if we could have that, that scripture up, and it goes like this. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that they may have life, and that's the Greek word um, Zoe life, translated all through John as eternal life, the God type of life, this, in, this unbelievable life that we have when we become born again believers. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So I want to share on this, on this particular theme this morning. But I'd just like to start by, by sharing with you my own personal story because it's very relevant to my message. Because I became a Christian at the age of 23. I became a born-again believer when I was 23 years old. Before that, as a, as a child, as a teenager, and as a young man in my early 20s, I always believed in God and I believed in Jesus, but I never, ever wanted to become a Christian. I had a belief system, but I didn't want to become a Christian because I had this conception that Christianity was all about being religious, being a goody-goody, and as a teenager, I didn't really want to be a goody-goody. You know, I, I, I thought it was all about being good and going to church and being religious. And so I thought, I don't want to become a Christian. It sounds so boring. I had a belief system, but I thought, I don't want to have a boring life. Anyway, my very best friend overnight became a fanatical born-again Christian, and he started witnessing to me. And I'd be listening to him, and whenever he would talk, in my heart, I knew what he said was right, but in my head, my, I got all those questions, oh, you don't want to become a boring Christian. So I sort of avoided it. Anyway, he, he witnessed to me nonstop, and after a couple of months, I'm sitting in his home in Sydney, in, in his kitchen, and he starts up again, he starts preaching at me, and this time, I was so convicted within my heart, I just knew it was right, but my head was just going crazy with all of these thoughts, you know, you lose all of your friends, it'll be boring, blah, 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 blah. So I said, that's it, stop preaching at me. He walked out of the room, I can remember this as, as though it was yesterday. He walked out of the room, and I'm just sitting there in his kitchen, after telling him, I, I didn't want to talk about it anymore, about 30 seconds later, he walked back in, and when he walked back in, the Holy Spirit came upon me. I had a massive encounter. I had a massive supernatural encounter with God. My whole body started pulse, started, started shaking, and I started, and, and it was like love and power and joy and peace were just flowing through me. It was a totally supernatural feeling. I had never in my life experienced such joy and peace and happiness. There was no drug known to man that could have done that could have could have resembled it. No amount of drinking. It was simply a supernatural encounter. It was like it was like ecstasy. It was not not the drug ecstasy, but it was like I was in ex it was just like heaven. It was just it was just pulsating through me. I didn't want to become I wasn't a Christian. And I didn't want to become a Christian, but the Holy Spirit came upon me and I said, what's happening to me? It was so powerful. And he said, and mind you, he'd only been a Christian for two months. He wasn't a, th he wasn't a theological giant. He said, well, when you told me to shut up, I went out and I prayed. And he said, this is what I, what I prayed. God, Michael thinks Christianity is boring and he thinks you're boring. Please touch him with your power. <laughs> At that point... I received Christ as my Lord and Savior. I'd had a miraculous conversion. But I just want to say this also, that every conversion is a miraculous conversion. Every conversion is a miracle. None of my, all of my children simply grew up in church. They've all, they've all, all they've ever known is being Christians. That is, that is just as much a miracle. But I just had one of those supernatural conversions, which was amazing. And at that point, I got a revelation on this verse, John chapter 10. Verse 10, it was as though I, at that point, I realized that the thief had completely deceived me. For 23 years, I'd believed that Christianity was a boring religion rather than the most amazing 
ultimate lifestyle that we can have with Jesus. And so I was so angry with the thief because he had ripped me off for 23 years. I also recognized at that point that my life was about to take on new meaning. At that point, I thought, I looked back and I thought, well, my life was pretty wild before I became a Christian, but it's nothing compared to what it's going to be now that I've got Christ in my life. I knew that life's ultimate journey was about to begin. But the other thing I realized instinctively that for my life to be an ultimate journey, for the ultimate journey to be the ultimate journey, I needed to be a witness for Christ. I just instinctively knew that because I knew that I was, in the words of Paul, I had been without God and without hope. And now I had God and I had hope. And none of my friends, I had a large circle of friends, not a single one of them, except my best friend who led me to the Lord, um, was a Christian. They were all without God and without hope. So, I, so right from the word go, I became a witness for Christ and I'd invite my friends along to church. And in those early years of being a Christian, I saw so many people come to Christ. I went to a church called Christian Life Centre in Sydney and every week we just saw so many people come to Christ. We then, um, then Hillsong Church started and at Hillsong Church we, again, we just saw so many people come to Christ every week. It was just a constant stream of people being born again. And I saw so many of my own friends and uh, people who I knew come to Christ. It was as though witnessing and soul winning was just the norm. It's just what happened. Uh, when I came to Melbourne, the same thing happened at Destiny Church every week. We saw so many people coming to Christ. It was the normal thing. But after a season, it wasn't happening as much. We, we had a Sunday night service where we'd always see people coming to Christ, but people stopped coming. Um, well, non-Christians stopped coming. Because when I was first a Christian, there was nothing to do on a Sunday back then. There, there wasn't multimedia. Um, restaurants and pubs weren't open. There was just nothing to do. So people would, you invited people to come to church, they'd come. And then, you know, after a period of time, there were so many other options. And we weren't seeing, I wasn't seeing non-Christians streaming in to church anymore because they had other things to do. But not only that, I wasn't leading people to Christ myself because I started hanging just with Christians. I was a church pastor. Everybody who I worked with was a Christian, I think. Yeah, they were. <laughs> and most of the people who I hung with were church people. So I'd become Christianized and I reached the, the sad conclusion that my best years have already gone, that I'm no longer seeing people coming to Christ. And it was very depressing. And so God spoke to me. He gave me a prophetic word through the Scriptures. It was actually Isaiah chapter 43 and verses 18 to 19. If we can, we've got this here. This is what God spoke to me. It was a prophetic word that God spoke to me. And God said to me, Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. You know, my former things was just seeing people coming to Christ, you know, everywhere. It was just amazing. But God said to me, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? A new thing. And this is a new thing. I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Rivers in the desert. I could relate to the rivers because I was around during the 1990s, especially when we were, <laughs> when the Christians were in the river. <laughs> You know, we had Rodney Howard Brown come out, had all those meetings. We had the Toronto Blessing and we had the Pensacola thing. And it was all about being in the river. And it's amazing having great encounters, encounters with God. Look, there, there is something awesome about coming to church and experiencing the rivers of the Holy Spirit, having great times of worship and listening to the Word and, you know, all of that, that type of stuff. It's, it's, it's amazing. But what God said to me, God said, yes, it's amazing having the rivers in church. But the new thing that I'm going to be doing is... I'm going to be taking the rivers from the church and taking them out into the desert, into the desert places where the lost people are, where the broken people are, where the lonely people are, where the sinners are, where the people who don't know me. Yes, it's amazing having great encounters with the Holy Spirit in church, but don't leave it in church. We need to be taking it out. And what, what God showed me back then was that every single believer can... Um, be part of this amazing new thing. This is a new thing. 
It has to happen. We cannot rely just upon the preachers and the evangelists and the musicians. It's the whole body of Christ has got to be able to go, to go forth. And so this morning, in my, um, with this message that I'm speaking, I just want to focus in on this. And I've, I've actually got three particular things that I want to talk about in regards to um, taking the gospel into the desert places. Three things that I believe relate to all of us. Um, you ready? Okay. The first thing which I just want to share with you is this, that not all of us are evangelists, but all of us have been called to be witnesses. You know, statistically, statistically, we are told that probably 10% of any congregation are evangelists. 10% are evangelists. However, 100% of us have been called to be witnesses. And that is something that the body of Christ, we've got to understand this. Um, one of our very, very favorite scriptures, of course, is Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. And Acts chapter 1 verse 8, uh, Jesus tells us, um, this, these were the last words that Jesus spoke before he ascended into heaven. These are Jesus' last earthly words. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of of the earth. God's called us to be a witness. Now, when I say witness, I'm not talking about a Bible basher. You know, I'm, I'm not talking about being a Bible basher, and I'm not talking about, you know, the traditional view of witnessing, you know, like Saturday morning we go out on street team and we go to people in the street and we witness to them. Now, there is a place for that, and there are some people who are very good at that. They're probably the evangelists who like going out. But when I say a witness, I'm talking about life. I'm talking about a 24-7 lifestyle. This is normal, Christi normal Christianity for a Christian is to be a witness 24-7 every day, all the time. And I'm not talking about Bible bashing. I'm talking about, for me, being a witness is being a blessing to people. It's connecting with non-Christian people and being a blessing to them, being Jesus to them. Because if we are a blessing to non-Christian people, at some point, they are going to be inquiring about your faith, why you go to church, why, why you do what you do. And being a witness at that point doesn't mean that we become a silent witness. It means that we actually then explain to them. So I am absolutely in favor. We have got to be connecting with people, but we also need to know what to do when the Holy Spirit gives us an opening. And let me promise you that if you become Jesus to people and you become a blessing to people, not just to sort of convert people, but to be a blessing, but at the same time within our hearts thinking, I'm going to be a blessing to you, but Lord God, I just pray I'll have the opportunity to lead this person to Christ. If you've got that attitude, the opportunities will come. And at that point, we need to know what to do. <laughs> And I'll just say this, that um, I have got, got, my, got my course, the Every Believer Can training course, which explains exactly what to do. And I believe later this year, you're actually going to be running it um, in your small groups. But anyway, so um, witness 24-7. God has called all of, the, all of us. The Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 to 20, um, some, a few bullet points here. This is what, how Paul describes it. He has given us the ministry of reconciliation. You are ministers of reconciliation, reconciling people who are without God and without hope towards God. He's given us the message of reconciliation, the message of the cross. He, we are called Christ's ambassadors. And get this, this is such a potent statement. God is making his appeal through us. God's making his appeal through us. That is, that, that is Paul. Now, I, I also want to let you know that the call to be a witness is not just some sort of nice little unimportant thing. It, it's, it's, this is an urgent call. It, it's, it, is, it is really, really urgent. In fact, when God called Paul, this is what he said, and it's in Acts chapter 26, verses 17, um, God said to Paul, and I believe he's saying to us, this, this is the urgency. I am sending you to them, to family, friends, neighbors, etc., to open their eyes because um, 
their eyes have been blinded. And this is the urgency. And to turn them from darkness to light. If someone doesn't know Christ, they're living in darkness. And it goes even more potently, and from the power of Satan to God. This is how God sees this call. So we are taking people from the power of Satan to God. Now, you mightn't like that terminology, but don't blame me. This is the Bible. This is what the Word of God says. It is, it is a very important call. Paul goes on to say in Romans chapter 10 and verse 14, um, he says, How can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? How can they? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? How can they hear unless someone tells them? That someone is us. This is God's plan. Um, and one of the things that we, we struggle with is we think, oh, well, you know, for even to talk about to talk about Christianity, you know, we need to get a Bible college. We need to be experienced. We need to, you know, be, at least be a Christian for a few years. Can I tell you, um, I started witnessing on the very first day that I became a Christian. I woke up on the first day and I knew I had to tell my friends. So I phoned up my two other best friends and I invited them over and I was determined to tell them that I'd become a Christian. I knew that they would ridicule me and I was very, very scared. In talking, I was so scared to tell them. Um, I think it's normal. No, it's for a lot of people to be nervous about sharing their faith. I was terrified about it. I was so scared that when they came in, I put on these great big black sunglasses, which had these sort of mirrored lenses so they couldn't see my eyes, sort of cover my face so they couldn't see how nervous I was. And I literally sat there and I counted from 10, 10 19, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3 to 1. Hey guys, last night I became a born again Christian and I told them. I was so scared. One of my friends um, ridiculed me for some time, but my other friend um, said, oh, can we talk about this a bit more? And I started, so I started witnessing to him on the very first day, and I led my second best friend to the Lord. Um, I had to witness to him for about, probably about six weeks to two months, then he received Christ. Some of you would have heard of this guy, his name was Jeff Bullock. And um, Jeff Bullock is a songwriter, and he's written songs like The Power of Your Love, and um, he was the first person I witnessed to. He was right out in the world like I was. And, but that was on day one. You don't, it's, you don't have to have a Bible college degree. You just be yourself. And I can tell you, I knew nothing of theology at all. Nothing. I don't know what I said. I was just, I guess all I said was, I have just had an encounter with God. Jesus is real. And they saw the fact that I was genuine. Anyway, so... So the first thing you need to recognize is you don't have to be an evangelist, but you are, you are a witness. Now, the second point that I just want to, want to highlight is this, that people in desert places, I'll even go further to say non-Christians, um, they don't understand the gospel. They don't understand it. They think they do. They think they know what Christianity is, but they don't. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4 says this, the God of this age, small g, speaking of the devil, the God of this age has blinded, has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Well, for 23 years, I had been blinded. I thought I knew what Christianity was. Oh yeah, Christianity. Christians are goody-goody people and they're nice and kind and they go to church. They are religious, nice people. Well, th th that's, that's true. But Christianity is a born-again experience. It's a supernatural encounter with God. And I didn't have a clue about that. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. You know, I've got a, um, a friend who I uh, spoke to a while ago. And um, she's actually my, my hairdresser. And it, she was cutting my hair on the Thursday before Good Friday. And she said to me, she said, Oh, I find Easter so hard. It's such a sad time. She, she's a lovely Catholic girl. And she said, I find Easter so hard. I don't understand why they call it Good Friday. So I said to her, I said, could I just explain to you why it's Good Friday? And I explained to her what Jesus had done, how he had forgiven, taken away all of her sin, and made her righteous and all of that. And she had tears in her eyes and she said, that is the most beautiful thing that I've ever heard. And I said, you go to Mass pretty much every week. Didn't you know this? People don't know. They think they know. They, they think they know. Your family think they know what Christianity is. They don't. 
They think it's a religion. They don't know it's a alive, vital relationship with God about becoming part of God's family. You know, um, I could tell you story after story about the times where I've simply explained the gospel and people have said, wow, I never realized that. But um, one, one particular occasion, which I just, just want to share with you, because this is an ongoing story. A while ago, probably about a year ago, I was lying down praying and I said, Lord, I've got no one to witness to at the moment and I'm telling people in churches they've got to go out and witness. Please lead me to somebody. I, want to, I just want to witness to somebody. Um, so I was praying that. And as I was praying this, in my mind... I saw a face of somebody who I recognized. I don't know whether you ever do that. You're praying and just impressions come. God speaks to me through impressions. Anyway, I saw this person's face and I thought, I know that face. That's the face of the man who sits down outside of the shops with a blanket on the ground asking for money. I live in the inner city and there's this fellow who asks for money. And I thought, I wonder whether God's calling me to witness to him. And I thought, well, let's just take the step of faith. So I got off the bed, got in my car, drove up to the shops, looked out, it's the middle of winter, and sure enough, he's sitting there. I thought, okay, this is going to be a God moment. So I started walking towards him, and I thought, I haven't got a clue what to do or what to say, because I don't go up and Bible bash people. I just, I find the Holy Spirit always leads me in, but not aggressively. So I'm walking up to the guy. About, about five meters away, the Holy Spirit spoke to me, so I, I, I knelt down to him, and the words that the Holy Spirit gave me was, hey, can I buy you a cup of coffee? It's really cold. Could I buy you a cup of coffee? And he said, yes, it's bleeping freezing. <laughs> I'd love a coffee, <laughs> white with two sugars or whatever. So I, I walked across the road, bought him a cup of coffee, came back, and I, and I just gave it to him. Didn't even say anything. I just said, hey, mate, here you go, and I walked off, knowing I'd see him again. So the next day I went up, went up there, with the purpose of seeing him. And he's there with a couple of other uh, people who, you know, sort of um, have issues. And he was talking to them. And I walked up and I said, hey. And I bought him another, another cup of coffee. And they asked me what I did. I always like it when people ask me what I do. So I said, I'm a church minister. And I was able to, to share the gospel with all of them, which is amazing. But, but with this fellow who I bought the coffee for, he became a friend, if you like. I'd see him a lot. And we would do coffees. It reached the point where he'd seen me. One day he saw me and he said, hey, do you want to do coffee? And I insist on paying. <laughs> this is a homeless. This is a, he's not homeless, but this is a guy who is begging for money. And I insist on paying, so we had coffee. Anyway, I would do coffees with him. And, but the thing was, he wouldn't let me preach the gospel. I'd start and he'd respectfully say, I really don't want to talk about this. i say, okay. Um, some people would just simply drop that person like a hot potato, but I'm, I'm now, I'm, I'm connected with him, and I'm praying for him. Anyway, to cut a long story short, it would have been probably after six months, he came up to me, and he said, he said, he said can you help me? And I said, sure. He said, I'm scared of dying and going to hell. Can you help me? So I said, let's sit down and have a cup, cup of coffee. We sat down, and I, di I, shared the, uh, the, I did the bridge illustration with him, which is the way that I present the gospel. And when I presented it to him, he received Christ as his Lord and Savior. And I tell you, it was one of the happy. It, it was just, I'm, I'm, I'm at my happiest when somebody comes to Christ. Anyway, um, I, I see him all the time, and a couple of weeks ago I saw him, and he was with his, his, his um, care worker. And he said to his care worker, he said, I grew up in a family where they made me go to church and I, and, you know, I, had, I had wrong ideas for my entire life until Michael sat down and explained the gospel to me. Wow. There are so many people like that. They think they know, but, but they don't. So we are witnesses. We are surrounded by people, our own family, our neighbors, our workmates, people who we meet who actually don't know what, what Christianity is. And Christianity is good news. It's the best news ever. It's life's ultimate journey, and they don't know it. Which leads me to the, to the third point that I want to, want to touch on. That point number three, the message of the cross. The message of the cross, which is the gospel message, carries supernatural power. 
the message of what Christ has done is not just a message. It's a message, it's a supernatural message that literally has power supernaturally attached to it. We know that in, in, Acts, in Acts chapter 2, when Peter preached the first sermon in Acts chapter 2, he preached it and there the people who listened, their hearts were just opened up. It was as though something supernatural gripped them. And 3,000 people made a decision for Christ. You know, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit, our heavenly helper, has come to convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. And I've discovered that when the message of, message of the cross is presented, it carries supernatural power. Their hearts are opened. And that's exactly what happened to me. My heart was opened up. And, uh, you know, um, in Acts chapter 10, Peter preaches to Cornelius and his family. And the Bible says that whilst he's just speaking the message of what Christ has done, as he speaks the message, the Holy Spirit fell upon all of them and they all got born again. The message we have has supernatural power, but people don't know it. I could tell you story after story, but I won't because time won't permit. But there is one story that I want to share with you that is, has been one of the most um, inspirational for me. A couple of years ago, my wife and I had a holiday in China, which is something you probably wouldn't be doing right now. <laughs> but we, we had this holiday in China, and my wife and I, we've, we've travelled a lot, and we pride ourselves on not going on tours. We always do our own thing. We go somewhere, we do our own transport, we do everything ourselves. We feel very competent travelling. But in China, it was a lot harder. Um, you don't get these signs in English, which you do in Europe. There's no English sign, so it's just kind of all, you know, in Chinese. Um, they don't, a, a lot of Chinese don't speak English, and we fell out of our depth in China. In fact, we were in one restaurant, and I had to, in order to order the chicken, I literally had to go, <laughs> that, was the, that was the issues that I had. Anyway, we're at... Shanghai Station, and we had to get a fast train from Shanghai to Beijing. So we got on this fast train, and let me tell you, it was a fast train. It, this train had a speedometer in the carriage, and I looked up and I thought, oh, 315 kilometers an hour, you know, like it was a fast train. Anyway, so we're sitting here, and this, this young professional Chinese, this young Chinese man um, sat, sat next to me, and... Praise God, he spoke perfect English, which was just great. So we were able to talk to him. And so in order to sort of get a bit of seed happening, um, I asked him what he did, hoping that he asked me what I did. So I asked him what he did, and he was, I don't know, a lawyer or some professional thing. And then he said, oh, what do you do? And I said, oh, well, actually, I'm a Christian church minister. And he said, oh, really? I've got some questions about, you know, I've got some questions about, about Christianity. So I said, look, I'd love to explain to you what Christianity is actually all about. And he said, well, I'd be very interested in hearing. So I said, so I got out this little serviette from a hotel and I got my pen and I did the bridge illustration, which sort of shows that Jesus is the bridge between, you know, the two sides. And as I was explaining it to him, he said, oh, yes, I understand. We're separated from God because God's light and we're dark, so we're separated. But Jesus has come... And Jesus has taken away our darkness so we're light so that we can move across with God. And I thought, this guy's understanding this. And I thought, he's understanding the message of the cross, this supernatural message. Anyway, um, we pulled into Beijing Station and my wife and I um, sort of walked off. And he said, he said oh, wait, um, where you're going, you aren't going get, to get back to your hotel. You've got to get onto another train. And we went, oh, no, this is stressful, another train, where, where do we go? He says, don't worry, I'll take you over to the, to the ticket counter. So he took us to the, to the ticket counter, and he bought us tickets. And I said, I said, thank you, how much? He said, no, no, I insist on paying. I said, oh, thank you. And I said, okay, uh, which platform do we go to? And he said, I'll walk you over. So he walked us over to the, to, the, to the platform, and we said, thank you. And he said, I'm getting on the train with you. And I said, but you don't live anywhere near. He said, no, no, I'm... I'm going to show you where your hotel is. So we got off at the station. He then walked us to our hotel. And I turned to him and I said, thank you. You are so kind for doing this. And he said, no, thank you. Because as a result of the message that you shared with me on that train, 
my whole life's been changed. It was the message of the cross. It was the supernatural message of the cross, just explained in a very, very simple way. So, this is the story. We're all called to be witnesses. People don't know the gospel. And the message we have, you don't have to be Billy Graham or Reinhard Bonnke to present it. You can just be you. Just be you. You can be you. But the message carries power. I just want to, as I, as I come to the close here, I just want to show you, the, this is the exact message that I shared with, with Tim, that man uh, who was asking for money, and this, this Chinese man. This is the message that I share with people. I want to show you um, how simple it is. And so this is, called, this is called the bridge. Could I have the first slide, please? This, this is what I say to people. I say to people, God's got an eternal plan. God's eternal plan is that he wants a family who will live with him forever. This is why in the Lord's Prayer, he sa- we are told to say, Our Father who art in heaven, fathers want children. And God's got an eternal plan. He wants you to become part of his family. But on the second slide, but we have a problem. The problem, so many people, their attitude is, God, I know you're real, but I can't reach you. God, I know, how many people do we know? Yes, God, I know you're up there somewhere, but I've got no idea how to, how to reach you. The reason is, is because God is, is perfect in every way, and we've done things wrong, probably billions of things wrong. So God is light, and we are darkness, and light and darkness cannot coexist. That is our problem. But God has a solution. The next slide, God's solution is one of the most wonderful scriptures, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Everything that we've ever done wrong, everything that we've ever done wrong, ever will do wrong, has been laid upon Jesus. And Jesus has taken away our sin. Um, that, is, that, is, that, is, that is God's solution. Um, the next slide, the good news of the gospel, the good news of the gospel is, Jesus has taken away our darkness. It's all gone. We are now light. We've become light, which means that we can coexist. And Jesus has become the bridge. He's the bridge. He's now made it possible for us to come in contact with God. This is the message that I shared. Then the next slide is our response. It's about faith. God's gift of forgiveness is a gift You can't earn it. This is what I thought Christians were. Just nice people. We're nice and nice. And if you look at other world world religions, it's all about following the rules, following the rules, following the rules. It's what we have to do. Christianity is what Jesus has done. And it is simply a gift. And our responsibility isn't to earn it, to be good, to become 100% perfect. It's simply, Jesus, I believe in you and I receive you as my Lord and Savior. It's, it's the Christian faith. That is what it's all about. And then what I, what I say finally, what I said to these, these people, the final slide is, I say, hey, um, where are you at the moment? Which side, which side are you on? And I say, do you want God's God's free gift of forgiveness? Do you want to become part of God's family? And so many people at this point, they go, is this real? I say, it's real. It's genuine. This is real. I say, "Is is this what you want? Yes, it's what I want. This is the greatest news ever. This is the good news of the gospel. This is the message that once believed causes a person to be born again into God's family. The fact that Jesus is the Son of God, he's come to take away our sins and give us, give us the gift of eternal life. Zoe life, eternal life. Have you ever considered why we, why we have to have eternal life, why we can't just die? I'll tell you why. God's looking for a family. The Father is looking for a family. He doesn't want a family that's going to die. God's family will be living forever with him, so he's given us the gift of eternal life so we can live forever with him. Amazing. This is the Zoe life that is in store for us. Awesome. (laughs) Praise God. Well, I just want to leave you with a challenge this morning. The challenge I'd like to leave you with is a bit of a story. Um, To explain the story, how how many of you like um, football, AFL football? 
Okay, a few of you. Now, if you're anything like if you're anything like my home church, you're probably Richmond supporters. Yes. Come on. Ooh. Yeah. Well, um, I'm a St Kilda supporter. That's I'm a saint. But anyway, so look, I'm, I just want to want to present to you a hypothetical here. In this hypothetical, season 2020 starts, and Richmond play their first game, and Dustin Martin starts on the interchange bench. And we think, that's a bit strange. We would have thought he would have been out on the field playing. But, surpri- but even more surprising, he spent the entire game on the interchange bench. We thought, how weird was that? Anyway, game, game two comes. Dustin Martin starts on the interchange bench where he just sits there and he doesn't play. He's waiting to go on to play. Um, and he spends the whole game on the interchange bench. Game three comes. Dustin Martin's on the interchange bench. Anyway, Richmond win the premiership in 2020. <laughs> but the, the incredible thing was Dustin Martin spent the entire season on the interchange bench. He never played. He's a star, but he never played. And Richmond win and the... You know, the announcements come and the names are called out and the players run up to get their little trophies and then they call out Dustin Martin's name and Dustin sort of runs up. But can I tell you, he's nowhere near as, near as excited as the rest of the players because he's never played. He's been on the interchange bench, not playing. He's never been out on the field. And for me, I don't want to be on the spiritual interchange bench. I want to be out there on the field. I'm not going to be a Bible basher. I'm probably not going to be going out on too many street teams, but I want to be 24-7. Wherever I go, I'm always aware. I'm looking for opportunities wherever I go. I, I live in the South Bank up on the 28th floor, up in the lift look for opportunities. The concierge is always looking for an opportunity. Praise God. Could we please stand in the presence of the Lord? And I, want to, I would like to, like to pray for you. I'd like to pray for you. The prayer is along the lines of this. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah had a massive encounter with God. We want to have encounters with God. Isaiah had a massive encounter with God. His heart was incredibly touched. He got a revelation of his forgiveness. He got a revelation of how good God was. Then he heard God's voice saying, Whom shall I send and whom shall go for us? This is the call. This is what God's saying now. Whom shall I send and whom shall go? And Isaiah, because he had a revived heart, he cried out to God, God, here I am, send me. For me, that is the sign of somebody in revival. It's wonderful to come, as I said, to come along and have encounters with God in church. But let's take it to the desert places where the broken people are where the broken people are, where the successful people are who don't know Christ. It's everybody. And so this morning, I want to pray for all of you here. Here I am, send me. Now, I could easily just say, if that's you this morning, put up your hand and I'll pray for you. But I don't want to say that because I don't want to think that there's anybody here who wouldn't put up their hand. I just feel this church, this church has such a heart to see this happen. I, I'm going to make this, this, this wonderful assumption that every one of you is thinking, yes, this is me. I might not know what to do. I might not be confident. I might, I'm, I might be scared and nervous, but I really, really, really want to be a witness for Christ. And I know that if I become a witness for Christ, God's going to step in and he's going to help me. And so right now, I'm going to, I'm going to, going to pray for you. But before I do, take, take 10 seconds or 20 seconds in your, in your own way, maybe through your mouth, through your mind, through your heart, whatever, just say to God, God, here I am. Please send me. Help me, Lord. I want to be a witness for you. I know you've called me. I want to be a witness for you. You just let God know right now. Thank you, Lord God. I want to thank you, Lord, for Manningham Christian Center. I want to thank you, Lord, for this church. And I want to thank you for this congregation gathered here this morning. I want to thank you, Lord, that you've called every one of them to be a witness for Christ. That, Lord God, that you have anointed them with your Holy Spirit. 
And I pray, Lord, that right now you will give them such a vision, such a hunger, such a vision, such a, such a passion for lost people. I pray, Lord God, that even for the most awkward feeling person in this room, may they realize that it's not about them, but it's about you. That it's, it's all about the Holy Spirit. Without the Spirit, we can do nothing. But Holy Spirit, as we make ourselves available, you come upon us. So Lord God, I pray right now that this church will become a salvation center that they will be renowned as having a congregation of people who know what it is, who know how to, how to share their faith with people, who know how to be loving, who know how to be Christ-like, who know how to make friends like Jesus to become friends of sinners. I pray, Lord God, for a massive breakthrough that the seed in this place will grow <coughs> a hundredfold, Lord God. I want to thank you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And everybody said... Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a clap. Praise God. Praise God. Just, just very quickly, I want to let you know, um, in a couple of, later this year, you're going to be in your small groups, you're going to be running, running um, my course. My course is designed for people who are nervous, shy, do not, do not know what to do. And by the time they've finished it, they know exactly what to do. And and they won't be a Bible basher, but they won't be the silent witness either. They'll be an effective witness for Christ. So you're going to be doing, doing that later. In the meantime, I've written, I've got my book here called Life's Ultimate Journey, which has got the bridge illustration, explains Christianity. There's some great stories. It's got my salvation story in there. It's got a whole lot of things. I wrote this book. I give this to non-Christians everywhere. Wherever I go, if I'm witnessing to somebody, when I leave, I say, hey, um, do you like reading? I've got a really good book. If I give it to you, will you read it? Because if people read this book, they can make a decision for Christ. I've got it here. Um, I give this to non-Christians for nothing, and I've given away hundreds of them, but I can't give them away to Christians for nothing. <laughs> I charge $10 because I've got, to, I've got to publish them. So if you want one of these, I've, I've got some at the, at the back there. They are $10 each. It, it, buy it, read it, give it to a non-Christian person. And I also just wanted to say very quickly, if... The bridge illustration, if you get onto my, my website, you can get a download of that. I've got all those pictures on my, I saw some of you taking the photos. It's there. I've also got some tracks you can download as well on my website, which is every believer can. Okay, praise God. Thank you for having me. I've had a, a great time and you've got great things in store. Praise God. Come on.